Hey there, welcome to the Healthy Vibes Podcast. I'm Kelly Renato, and today I have a special guest with me, Marnie Jameson. She's America's most beloved home and lifestyle columnist. Besides writing a weekly nationally syndicated column on all things home, she is also the author of seven best selling books. Today, we talk about getting richer with living with less and tips to lighten up. It's a great conversation. I think we all can relate to decluttering, whether it's our home, our parents' home, right sizing, downsizing. So listen in and I hope you enjoy. All right, Marnie, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I'm really excited to talk with you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, The topic we're going to talk about, it's just, it's so relatable to many people, but um, I feel deep in it right now. And so I'm I'm just excited to hear from you after reading your article. And um, before, before we get going deep into it, I would love for you just to tell the listeners a little background about yourself and what you do now and where Sure. So I, I write a nationally syndicated home and lifestyle column. It's a pairs in papers every week. And the topics run the gamut from, as, as Kelly's article you mentioned, she mentioned, is living with less or but really creating a beautiful home and considering your budget and, and living a gracious lifestyle and whether it's entertaining or choosing an area rug. And, and I just write about things that I'm curious about. And I just recently bought some art and I tried to figure out what makes a piece of art worth more than another one. And, you know, just the questions that we all have as we go through life. And I'm not the expert, but I I know how to find them. So I I ask a lot of questions, which is probably my my strength. Um, So yeah, I've been writing this column for about 20 years. And, um, you know, I started when my kids were in grade school and now they're, you know, off in the big world. So it's, it, we've had a, a good run. So it's, uh, it's been, it's been good. And I, and I've also published seven books along the way. So, um, that, that's been fun too. Wonderful. And I, I'd like to get to those too, if we can, um, the article I read, which you're right, you do write a variety of topics. And the article I read was get richer living with less and tips to lighten up and, this is so such a good topic, but the few that you mentioned, I just love the whole avenue of, like you said, you know, graciously living in your home and, and just how you go through the decision process of all these things. Um, but this living with less, and that's what we're going to talk about today, which is such a good topic. Um, but I would first, and it, just, just to start, like, um, you know, where does someone start? Like, just if someone came to you and said, like, I'm overwhelmed, I don't even know where to begin because it's layers and layers and layers. And I'm talking about our own house, maybe just in our own house. Where do we begin? Well, you, I just had an email and I'm going to be writing about this from a woman who said, I want my house back. That was her, (laughs) that was her. That's a good one. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I'll tell you in a second what, what we're going to do with her. But I think you have to start by caring and you have to really want something. And what in your life ha- have you ever gotten that you really wanted that you didn't try, right? You've got to, you've got to care. You've got to try it. It can't just be a passing fancy like, oh, my house is a mess. I wish it weren't. It has to be, what do I need to do to get from here to the place that I want my house to be? And it can feel like evil can evil jumping the Snake River Canyon. but Right. You- you can do this, and I think it's really important that that you have the motivation. So we can talk about, you know, what is your motivation? Is it to feel proud when your friends come over? Is it to feel a sense of peace and calm when you walk through your home? Is it so you can park two cars in the garage? Is it so you, you know, don't have to worry about opening a closet and having an avalanche fall out? Is it because you spend too much time finding things you've lost because you have too much stuff between you and those things? There's a whole bunch of reasons, but your motivation needs to be what drives you. That's and that's good. where you start. You start in right. your heart with a wish, a, a vision, a dream, and then you get going. And I know that's kind of vague, but we can talk about specifics on, and how to get there for, for this particular woman. And I'm going to talk to her a little bit more in, in depth, but she had a boundary problem. And not only a personal boundary problem, her kids were moving back home. They were dropping, using their, her house as sort of a, a dumping ground for they were having kids, their kids' toys. 
Um, there was just a blur. She'd had her mother-in-law living there for a while and, and every room just started getting, losing its purpose. And her office, which she's a professional, she has a telehealth clinic, medical clinic, and it had a, a crib in it for her grandson. If she just, just no, you know, every room has right. to have a purpose, has to be devoted to that. You can have a playroom, but don't let the toys be all over the house. You can have an office, but don't let it merge with the guest room. So to try to have specific purposes and, and honor them. And she talked about an elliptical machine that just gave her a case of the guilt every time she woke up because it was in her bedroom and she never oh, used it. Gosh. I'm like, you don't have room for it. Get it out of your bedroom, sell it, and use the money for a gym membership. She's going to do that. So don't, you know, if you have a, equipment in your room, it's just making you feel bad and just some place for you to hang your clothes. That's not working for you. Right. So, that's a lot of information, but these are the kinds of things I want people to sort of own and think about and look around their own lives and their own homes and say, is there stuff here that's just in my way that just makes me feel bad? Is there bleed over from one room to another? Do my rooms have a purpose? Uh, are there boundaries to my rooms? Like, you know, the kitchen is where we eat and cook. It's not where, you know, you, you put the carburetor when you're changing it. Right. right. <laughs> So these are really good points, though, because I think what you said in the beginning, you have to care and you have to try, like, it's really important just owning the fact that what you have is not working and not making you feel good. So I get that it's overwhelming, but I like the motivation of what is it that's driving you? What is it you want to change? And, um, you know, figuring that out one thing at a time. But you use a term called right-sizing. And I think you even wrote a book about it. Is that correct? I did. One um, of your books? Yeah. My most recent book came out in January called Right Size Today for Your Best Life Tomorrow. I love that. And and you, you am I correct? You kind of say, instead of saying we're going to downsize, we're going to right size? Yes, that's exactly right. So okay. to, to back up, I, I started writing about downsizing, oh, 10 or so years ago when my parents moved into assisted living, they'd gotten elderly and weren't able to take care of their house anymore. And my job was to clear it out and sell, to sell the house ultimately um, to help finance their long-term care. And the house was in California and I live in Florida. So I couldn't just take it all home with me and I needed, I was working, I couldn't spend you know, half a year doing this. I had a, a week and a weekend. <laughs> so oh. um, anyway, I, I wrote a book about that whole process. And, That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And we can talk about getting rid of loved ones, things at some point too. But, but um, that started me on this whole, I wrote the downsizing the family home. And then my husband and I met in, in, 10 years ago and, and I, we were both, he, he had a, he was a widower and I had gotten divorced and we moved in, obviously got married and, and had a house together. And I, realized that one house, he had a fully loaded house. I had a fully loaded house and one house plus one house has to equal one house. Oh, <laughs> so boy, yeah. downsizing the blended home when two families become one or two households become one. And you had, we had to get rid of like a whole house, you know, stuff and, and it's personal. And there were, we, you know, we get along really great, but we had a few grounds <laughs> of <over> the dining room. <laughs> so I would um, bet. There was that. And then I wrote a legacy leaving book, a book about estate planning and, and just like, how do you want your legacy to fall your, your things? Where do you want them to go when all is said and done? And it's called what to do with everything you own to leave the legacy you want. And all of this, Kelly, is I realized that I was sort of depressed to talk about downsizing and letting go and, um, you know, le legacy leaving, which is really when you die. I'm like, this is this is getting to be really grim. <laughs> so right. I, oh, my God. Right something more upbeat and yes. right sizing, you know, it really is what it's all about. It's living for now with only what you need, use and love now for the stage of life you're in now. I always tell people, you know, if you're 60 years old and have your 30 year old son's Cub Scout uniform, you have issues. You I know? <laughs> Move on. <laughs> so you have to like really embrace where you are. And, you know, you, you, if you're, if you've got three kids, you're not that high school cheerleader anymore. We are into a new phase and right sizing is about moving to or creating a home that is the perfect physical in terms of size, financial, in terms of affordability, emotional, in terms of it feeds you in and it nurtures those who live there, and social, it's close to the things that are important to you 
outside of your home, your church, your schools, and things you love. So it's the right physical, financial, emotional, and social fit. And that's right sizing. And that so you have to look around your house and go, is this supporting who I am right now and who I want to be going forward? So this is so much good stuff with what you just said. And I can go in a lot of directions. I want to cover each one of them. And and let me before we jump into that, that I feel like you've the things you've said about living in the now and living with enough, but what what are some health benefits that people really could relate to when you declutter and you right size and you get rid of things that you feel you have all these emotional attachments to, but when you're all said and done, like I know there's health benefits to decluttering. Well, I mean, let's start with just having less means you don't have to pay for the real estate it takes to to hold up. Yes, yes. absolutely. Need, spend the time maintaining it, storing it, insuring it, all of that. Oh, it's yes. A, it's a resource suck on you, on your life. And whatever is going in a direction that's not empowering you to be stronger, better, and healthier is doing the opposite. So it's like, you know, putting it, you know, ankle weights on and every day you should go through life. And so, yeah. so I think that we really need to start with that. There's a serenity and a peace that happens when you have less and you can open your closet and see to the wall instead of just everything, everything jammed. There's a feeling like, gosh, there's room for me to grow. There's room for me to be. There's, I'm not stressed by having, you know, being, being claustrophobic or all these things. So there are some really good studies about, making your bed every day, people are happier, live longer, do better, are more successful. I mean, it's having a clean and tidy home is, is a sense of control and mastery that you can go out into the world and, and just kill it. Right. Mm -hmm. your I would home, agree with you. Your home is under control. And if it's, if, if your home is in a mess, you're going to be an emotional mess. You're going to be a social mess. You know, you're just going to be playing cover up all the time. So, it really does start, everything does start at home. And if you can start from a clean, clear, uncluttered base that you feel proud of and in control of, that'll be a reflection through your whole life. I couldn't agree more when you just said um, everything starts at home. It's so true. And, um, and I think we've you know gotten busier and rushed and we're running around. And even with kids, I noticed there were years where I could have never been home but I realized I had to choose to be home. Like, like you need that, that peace, all of that, when you get home, a place that you enjoy to be. And so let's go to that personal, you talked about merging the two households yeah. and that's pretty personal when, when you had to get rid of, and even if you don't, you're not merging two households, I, I feel like I have cleaned out for years. I was on a declutter kick for years. And I still look around and on my list this week is clean my office out again. Like it just continues to come. But when something's personal, like what helps you get rid of that personal stuff or just make the decision when you look at like, let's, you know, pick a room to start with. Well, I, I tell people to start in a less emotional space to get oh, some momentum. Good. Yeah. So like people always say, where do you start? Well, you don't start with your family photos or your jewelry box. <laughs> you're going to be, you know, in a, in a sinkhole of sentiment and they're not that big. The spaces aren't that big. So, so maybe start with the garage. Cause if it's in the garage, how, you know, sentimental can it be? And, and once you can park both cars in a two car garage, you're going to feel pretty good about yourself and then get the, let the momentum go into your linen closet. How attached can you be to a, a pillow and, you know, kind of start throwing things away <laughs> are not that used or, you know, sheets that you're never, you don't like them. They're hot or they pill or they scratch or they don't breathe or whatever. Why are you keeping them? So just get rid of all the things that are really not making your life better. And then, and then start moving into the more personal areas. And, you know, I, I am, I am not somebody who wants to get between you and the things you love. I'm not the stuff police. And I have mm. things that I'm attached to that I would never give up that I really love. And I think it's important that they define us and, and we endow things with meaning because they represent a time in our lives. But I think the, uh, the, the takeaway I want people to have is when everything is important, nothing is important. And oh, I that's good. You got to find that sweet spot of, you know, you can't save every piece of artwork your kid ever made in school, right? That's just stupid. 
And maybe there's one piece that symbols their kindergarten year. I don't know, paper mache cat. I kept one of my daughters made. I really liked it. And I kept it for a long time. But you don't have to save all of it. That one piece was special to me. And it kind of represented her entire art phase of her youth, right? So I also say, I know if you're dealing with saving something that has sentiment from a loved one that maybe is no longer with you, keep the pearls, not the piano. So when my mom passed, I didn't take the family piano. I don't even play the piano, but we had his piano and no, it's just too big. But I kept her pearls because she wore them every day and they were close to her. And so I guess pick a few things, choose the cherish the few and small and hold those dear and let the rest go. And another way of letting go of things that might seem sentimental to you is I believe that you can have a trial separation. And I think that's really helpful. Um, And kind of going back to your, you know, the decluttering never stops. I have a bag in my closet and I have a box in the garage and I move things into those boxes and bags regularly. And I, sometimes I'm hovering like, oh, maybe I really like those candle sticks or, oh, really, maybe I'll like that sweater again. And if I don't look back after, you know, after a couple months and I'm not missing them and I look and I go through that box, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. But, you know, it, you, it, it doesn't feel so final if it's still sitting in the garage or it's still sitting in your closet. You can kind of, you think, well, I can revisit this. And I go through it before I take it to the Goodwill and I almost never, I, I really can't, I can almost say never, never take anything back, but it helps me break up. Right. That's good. That's, that's a good, good thought because you have that, like, it's not final yet for someone that's having a hard time, mm-hmm. but Just I put yeah. it in a box, put it under the bed, put it out of sight. And if you, you know, let it ride for six months. And if you're just not pining for it, you can, you can live without it. Maybe and see, was my life better without it? Yeah, probably. Probably. I know what the, what you said when everything is important, nothing is important because it's a, it's a constant, almost distraction. Like you can't enjoy the present when you have all of these things. And I'm, you know, so going to the cleaning out of, um, like you said, cleaning your parents' house out, that was where this article (laughs) that, that you wrote. And I did laugh, which I was glad to laugh because you, you have a great humor in your writing because many times cleaning my parents' house out, I was crying a lot because it was, Mm -hmm. it was overwhelming and exhausting. And I can't imagine doing it in a weekend, like Mm -hmm. you just said, because it was a, it was a long process. Um, And we did the, I was reading in your thing. We did, we, my siblings and I agreed we were going to get a storage to help us move, clean it out quicker. And then we would then clean the storage out. Uh, <laughs> I know. I knew you were going to say that. And I've debated telling you, but your article, it's great. So, and it did help clean the storage out or, or the house out, excuse me. Um, and then since then, the storage got downsized to even like a smaller storage. Um, but it's that stuff that you look at. And that's what I finally said. I'm like, I'm going to look at the storage whatever I want, I'll take. And after that, I'm done. So, you know, it's your turn, (laughs) but it's the letting go of the things that were your dad's that he's no longer here, your mom's and she can't have them because she's now moved to an assisted living. Um, and how do you let go of that? (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of play it forward. I, this is, this was, eye-opening to me. I was I was giving a speech on downsizing um, in April, I think, in Baltimore. And afterward, it was through a financial planning group, you know, older, not seniors who were retired and they were, you know, looking at maybe downsizing or, um, and, and this woman came to me afterward, she's probably 70. And she said, and I gave my spiel on storage units, which I'm happy to give you <laughs> the spiel. Um, and she said, I have a storage unit with my parents' bedroom furniture in it. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, and I'm like, ah, oh. and she looked ashamed. And she says, I guess I need to give it up. I said, you got to, you're paying $150 a month? I mean, uh, multiply that out. How much is this thing worth? Probably not even that. Nope. And somebody could, could benefit. Who's benefiting from anything in a storage unit? Your parents would kick you up the side of the head. They'd say, give it to someone who can use it. Give it to a child who needs a bed at night. Come on. So, I mean, 
I hope she's gotten rid of it and, and sold or given away, donated whatever's in there because it is such a waste of money to do that. And, you know, my parents had some beautiful things too, but I wasn't bringing any furniture home. I lived in Florida, but I think you have to look at it and go, it, it served its useful life. My parents were in their home for almost 50 years and they, the furniture did it, did its job. It supported them. And I didn't need it to clutter up my home, which was blending with somebody else's home. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Really. Let go. go I love all of that you said. So, and, and you said your parents would get upset with you. So what about the people? And I, and I don't know if it's a generational thing. It's, um, you know, I'm not sure, but I, I know people and I personally, we've, I've cleaned out, not just my parents, you know, the in-laws house, the aunts, my aunt's house, like there was a lot along the way, you know, that you had to, it, it ended up coming to you. And I remember saying to myself, I will never do this to my kids. And you talk about the legacy and there's this, you know, the parents, well, what did you do with the dining room? The parents that make you feel like, well, what did you do with this? Well, what did you do with my China? All the things that like you just said, uh, I donated them. (laughs) I, you know, I gave them to, I like you, I paid it forward. We're not using them. So we're giving it to someone. So do you have any tips for the kid, the, the people that are feeling guilt from their parents about what to do with what they did with our stuff? Cause because they had a hard time letting go of their stuff. So now you have to let go of their stuff for them. <laughs> yeah. So there are so many things to say on that. So so one is, you know, the kids don't want your stuff. The ki- older adults just need to understand. In general, yes. the kids don't want your old brown furniture. They want their own furniture. So get over that and don't lay a big guilt trip on them for not wanting your stuff. It's just, it's mean. And I tell I tell seniors, oh, but... You know, I'm saving my, you know, heritage headboard because I know my daughter's going to want it someday. <laughs> no, ask your kids if they want it. If they say no, believe them and then get rid of it. And if, you know, they come back in five years and say, mom, I really wish you'd save that headboard for me. Then you just say, well, a parent's job is to, is to help kids learn from their mistakes. So congratulations. I hope you learned something. That's your benefit, but don't hang on to it with the wishful thinking that they're going to change their mind because they're probably not. So I just don't think that 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 dynamic is just real. And I'm speaking to an older adult generation. So you're the one in the generation of getting things tossed at you and, and along with the guilt trips. And you just say it's, we well, first of all, you can sell these items that you don't want and use the money to get something you do want. And you say, I repurposed it into something that makes me feel really happy. Mm -hmm. I I bought a kitchen table for my family that we really needed. I sold the, you know, the sideboard or whatever, the China cabinet and and transferred that asset. It conveyed into something more meaningful and useful to me. That's probably going to make him feel good, but otherwise it's on them. Right, right. And some other ideas to people that don't even know where to, in order to um, pay it forward, you know, and it's, I always feel, I know some stuff is just trash, but there's a lot of things that there's someone out there that can use them. And I know there's so many organizations. Um, Do you have any simple, just to guide people that are like, I have all this stuff. I don't even know where to start. Oh, there are so many places. So the mustard seed here in Orlando, but there are other other um, communities across the country that have places where you bring furniture that helps people need who need to get on their feet again, who are either sometimes it's, it's you know, families, women in domestic violence situations, you have to start all over, ran, you know, ran to get a new life, some families who've lost their houses in devastating fires or floods. So yeah, they, all sorts of things you can send there. There is the buy nothing project, which I'm a big fan of. That's um, it's, there's no money exchange, but you join the Facebook group. And I, you know, just got rid of an office chair that I, I would place. And I said, Hey, you know, office chair, anybody who wants it, you know, and you put it on, on your Facebook, you take a couple pictures and they, it's free, right? People come and pick it up off your porch. And that's a great way to just right. you know, get things out into the community. So they're, you know, obviously the usual donation centers um, are really great. And 
um, you know, if you have an asset that nobody gets but you, let's say you have, you know, original, I don't making this up, Beatles albums or uh, Pez dispensers or I don't know, an Elvis Presley poster that he signed. I don't know, some memorabilia that you think is worth something and nobody in your family gets it. They don't understand your stamp collection or your coin collection or whatever. But you know it's worth something. Put some instructions in there as to who to call the coin collector shop or the the particular auction house that would understand this particular vintage item and make sure it you know falls into the hands it's going to dis dispose of it meaning sell it to appreciable an appreciable um, buyer that's a good idea because there's always something like that that someone sees a value in that you don't understand for right. sure because we all have different you know there's a crazy and... story in one of my books. Um, I think it's the legacy book, what to do with everything you own, where there was a, a woman who was a Chicago banker and her dad was a farmer and he had all this old, these old rusty tractors and farm equipment on this big farm. And when he died, she was like, oh, geez, now I got to do, you know, tractors and stuff, you know, you know, all this stuff. And, um, and he made some jokes to her once he goes, yeah, you'll probably just all sell it for melt or something. But she, somebody came by and said he'd offer her $150,000 for like five or six tractors. And fortunately, she didn't take it because she came across a fellow called, it's Almond Auctions. Kurt Almond owns a company that sells antique tractors by auction. And he goes to farms all over the Midwest and collects these antique tractors. And people have this fondness for their John Deere days. And they sold a, this one of the tractors was a 1911 tractor sold for five hundred and sixty five thousand dollars at auction. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And she was going to put it in the rust heap. So wow. this is not an excuse for you to cling to your parents old stuff. But parents tell your kids if there's something valuable. Kids have the where have somebody come through and say this might be worth something. You should have it looked at more closely. But right. Anyway, you have to be careful. You want to be a good steward of your parents' things. You don't want to just sell, you know, a Winslow home or painting for $5. But most of the stuff is not worth what anybody thinks it's worth. That's the real lesson here. And that's a good point, though, that you just made. Because I agree. When we cleaned my parents' house, someone was like, I have someone that you can just pay to clean it out. And I said, no. I said, that's not what I want to do because I absolutely wanted to go through and, and respect my parents' stuff, mm -hmm. you know, even though it was a huge job and make sure if there were things that were valuable, you know, for the exact same reason. Um, one of the other things you said in your article to kind of same thing, but switch up just a little, you said living in the past robs you of the present, which we talked, you kind of brushed on that earlier, but I think that's so huge in, it seems simple. But I think some people that are struggling to get rid of stuff um, maybe don't think about it that way, that it really is holding them back. Is there, how would you help someone like that, that it's just, they are like just hanging on to whatever it is, if it's a storage, if it's a some, something that they should get rid of. And it's, it is robbing them of what's right in front of them right now, the joy of whatever their life is. Well, the storage is a, is just is just daylight robbery or dark yes. dark robbery. I don't know. That's just a huge asset suck that you really. That's just just terrible idea. And one in ten people has a storage unit in this country, which is really a problem. But I think that is mm, probably the first place to really get rid of stuff. But I think if you know, we don't know the future, but we do know the past, and the past tends to be a little bit more comforting because it's known. But hanging on to your f former self, your former career, your former, uh, I don't know, when you were having little infants and, and saving their baby rattles when they're now, you know, driving, you know, you just, yeah, you need to enjoy, like you have these teenagers, they're fascinating, they're changing so fast and they're vibrant and they're living on the edge of life, maybe a little too much, <laughs> but <laughs> You, you know, if you're still wallowing in sadness for their time, you know, when they were sitting on your laps, you're missing out. You're missing out on the really cool people they are right now. So absolutely, you know, just embrace the time you have because it, it flies. And, you know, my kids are all, all out of the nest for sure. But and one of them just had a baby. So it's a whole new, it's a whole new, mm, it, 
era and I want to be ready for it. And I don't want things holding me down or holding me past. I don't want to be that boring person who can't move on. But I, and I'm looking forward to, you know, the next, the next phase and the next generation, because there's, there's a lot to be said for it. Absolutely. I, I agree. Um, so with those books that you wrote, would you say that what, which of your books would you say would help someone get started? Do you have like, you know, cause it sounds like you've written on several topics. Well, it depends on what's going on. I mean, if you're if you're getting married and moving in with someone, absolutely get downsizing the blended home when two houses become one. Because nobody, I was on, I was actually writing this. I I went on a cruise, a transatlantic cruise, which is really boring, but it's exactly what you need if you're writing a book because somebody makes your meals and makes your bed, and you have nowhere to go. So. <laughs> I, uh, I was sitting, I was sitting at dinner that was made for me um, at that one night with my husband and there's a couple next to me and, and they were from Canada and, the, and they were saying, well, what is your book about? I said, oh, you know, blending homes when you get married in the midlife. And he said, you need a book for that? I'm like, yeah, it's love, power, control, and money. Heck yeah. You need a lot right. of <laughs> need a book. So um, downsizing the family home goes back to something that you talk, touched on is um, you don't want to leave a mess for your kids. You don't want to do this to them. And, and our parents, well, I don't know about yours, but mine were, you know, th- really thrifty. They came up in kind of a depression era and they, they, my mom saved baggies. I mean, it was, uh, they saved all kinds of things, every dime store vase that came in and we had a little house and it was so cluttered because she just really, it was just, everything was precious. And our, our generation and since then we have a very high consuming society. You can get, you know, vases and sheets and everything at Target and go through them and, and you know it's it's just easy. Things are easy to get. Right. And we end up, you know, stockpiling as a result. They that's why they kind of hoarded because they would have sheets they got for their wedding day and it would last them 30 years. So we don't do that. And, and as a result, we have too much stuff. So we have to realize we're living in different times and we need to be able to let go of those things. And um, so I wrote Downsizing the Family Home, both for people who don't want to leave a mess to their kids and also for adults, young adults like I was doing and you have done, was cleaning out the family home and what kind of a burden it is. So that is... A, Really, it's a rite of passage. No one gets out of here without doing that. And you've done it several times. <laughs> so it's just, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's you're going to get stuck with it, whether an in-law, a step parent, whatever. Right. You're going to deal with this. So that's a good one. And that's probably, well, I know it's far and away the biggest seller. It's, um, it's a big problem that a lot of people have to come to grapps, gripple, grapples with. Um, you know, if you're in the plan, if you're in the planning stages of like planning a will, and if you have children and you want to have an estate and you, you need to have everything kind of buttoned up and you want to leave a legacy, you don't want to leave a, a financial disarray when you leave, then, then what to do with everything you own. And if you're looking to move or thinking, wondering if, if your household's changed and people have moved out or they're moving in or whatever it is, the right sizing one, it has a lot of exercises in it saying, Gosh, who am I, and who who do I want to go, and how what what is the perfect home set up for me, and am I living in in the best house? In the first of all, in the best city, maybe you're in the right city, but in the wrong kind of house, or am I living in the? Should I move somewhere else? Would I be happier somewhere else? And if I went somewhere else, in what would I live? What kind of home? And then the final piece of that book, which really I think could be a book in itself is kind of the with what. So a really cool aspect of, I think, of Right Size Today is the last part of the book is on, it goes room by room and it's, it's, I titled it Buy It Once, Buy It Right. It helps you outfit every single room in your house with the very best materials, very best, like let's say in the kitchen, the best knives, the best wine glasses, the best cutlery, the best table towel linens, um, all like just surround yourself with quality, not quantity, mm-hmm. because people end up with too much because they don't know how to buy it right the first time, and they succumb to the marketing and they the packaging and the pictures, and they don't know the qualities to look for. So this talks about 
the quality to look for in linen, the quality to look for in sheets in the bedroom, the quality to look for in your bath soap. So you actually only have wonderful things and you fill your, you don't fill them, but you put in your cupboards and closets, only wonderful high quality items. So you're surrounded with greatness and not anything that, that doesn't elevate you. I love that though. And that's at the end of the right sizing book you said? Yep. yep it's the okay. last I think that's such a such a good point for this time too, though, because people see all these things on social media, and you just see all these ads. That I mean, it's like a, I was talking to a mom at the my daughter's softball game, and we were talking. I can't remember what we were talking about, but we laughed because she was saying, "Well, because we talked about this, we will both see ads on, you know, that'll pop up. It's like whatever you talk about, and yeah. without really knowing if it's even good stuff or not. There's so many companies and where they come from, and so I like that. That's good. Yeah, and um, kind of like for sheets, like how, what is this thread count wars and, and what is what are we really looking for here? And it, it helps you be a better consumer um, and not and, and it really it, it goes like how to buy good furniture. Like, how do you know if it's a hard frame sofa or not? Like just it gives you all the parameters and not not so much the brands to look for, but the qualities because we don't like a pair of, you know, a set of knives, so we buy more knives, but the other ones aren't that bad, so we keep them and we end up with too many knives. You know, it goes on and on, and our houses get filled up with mediocre items because we don't know what we're doing. This is so true. And um, I just the, the, the component you talked about of knowing if the home you have is the right home or another home and um, I've talked about that a lot too, because it does start in the home and we, we get to choose and have control over what is in our home and what is not and what makes us feel good and what doesn't. But I think sometimes we just don't get intentional about it. So it sounds like that book talks a lot about it. It does. And it also reminds people kind of circling all the way back to our beginning about why we should have less is a lot of times people stay stuck. What are the, the person I wrote this for is I'm thinking of someone who, who's maybe the kids are leaving. You're getting close to that. Once your kids are out of high school and off, like if you, if you're living in your house because it's close to a job that you no longer go to or commute to, or it's close to schools that your kids no longer attend, why are you there? Like, what, you know, maybe you bought this home because it was close to your job, but now so many people are working from home or their jobs have changed and the kids are now in a different college. So you have a chance to have a, have a do-over and where would you live if you were choosing? And what happens, Kelly, is that people get, their houses are so full of stuff. They say, and this makes me want to cry. It's just not worth the trouble. It's just too much. And they just resign. Having less stuff, having an empty attic and not too many things keeps you nimble so you can pick up and go and you can have a dream. You go, oh, I'm going to live on a condo by the beach. This is my chance. Oh, but I've got this 3,500 square foot house with all this furniture. Well, you don't have to let that saddle you down. So again, live for the per per place you're going, not for the place you've been. And really, really be critical about why you choose, why you choose to live where you're living and where would you live if you could live there? And what are the barriers between you and that great life? And a lot of times it's your stuff and then start selling things, giving it away, downsizing and becoming more nimble and free. There's so much truth in that. And when we moved several years ago, my kids had been in the same home since they were born. And I felt like as much as I had cleaned the home out, there was still a lot. And we talked about moving for, for our, you know, whatever personal reasons at the time, we wanted a different house. We wanted a bigger yard, a pool before our kids graduated. Like there were things that we wanted and that's why we were moving, but our house sat on the market so long and it started feeling too big, too much. And I kept saying, no, I wanted my kids. I, I wanted them to feel the moving process because I felt that <laughs> it would be good for them for exactly what you just described, that they would see it was possible. Yes, it was hard, but it was possible. And we got the house that we really wanted. And on the other side of all that hard, both of my kids have said that to me multiple times. I'm so glad that we moved. I love our new house. And I just wanted them to feel that it seemed impossible. It could easily seem not worth the trouble, but it was worth all of it to do it. Well, I think you taught them a very, very valuable lesson. And 
something that my dad used to tell me, and I've used that this analogy is keep your eye on the ball. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you're going through a very difficult, you know, transition, keep your eye on the ball. I want I want this house. I want my yard. I want a, a yard for my kids to play on. I want a pool. I want room for the dog to run around. Whatever it is you want. And but you're and you're mired in this. Oh, I got to go through these boxes. And I'm packing. Ugh. Um, but see, it's vision. Vision your life. And and then just keep driving the course. Mm-hmm. And hearing you say that, I've learned so much on the other side of it. But that was exactly it. Um, and your kids seeing that it's nothing bigger than for your kids to see it or experience it with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me ask you: Do you have besides you said keeping the box in the bag? Is there anything else you do year to year, month to month, to keep your house cleaned out or? De- declutter just to keep going? Um, I just think it's important that, and I'll talk about, per, you know, what I do, but I, I think the bigger, I, the bigger question is that downsizing and decluttering and getting organized is not a one and done. You don't do it once and it takes care of itself. It is right. like exercise. You've got to maintain it. You don't, or, you know, if you diet and exercise and get down to the perfect pant size that you want to be, you, if you don't maintain it, you're going to go right back. Right. So right. it's, it's takes an effort a little bit every day to just, I, I just sort of sweep my eyes around from time to time. And I start to say, okay, it's this, it's time for this to go. This is, this is, this is get feeling down. It feels dated. It's ready. I'm ready to let this go. And I kind of always have that outlook as I go through my home and then there'll be little pain points. So it might be the drawer where we store the, the batteries and the <laughs> chargers. The junk drawer. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. Every house should have a junk drawer, but, um, but you know, some of them just get to be so unwieldy. Or if I, you know, I've, I've just bought more mustard and I go to the pantry and find three more bottles in the back. So yes. if, you, if you're doing this, something's not working. And so I think it's constantly just, it's a little bit of maintenance every day really keeps the boat afloat. I think that's the way that would be. It's not a one and done. It's a lifestyle and it's ongoing and continually weed and, and take care of those pain points when the a certain drawer looks out of hand, just tackle it and you'll feel, you'll feel good about that. So I guess just kind of don't stop. I like that though, that it's not a one and done because yeah. that that's, that's huge. Cause I feel like years ago when I, my old house, it was after having kids, I think that I was started the whole clean out. And I did like, I would just tell myself every week, I'm going to do a drawer. I'm going to do a cabinet. I'm going to do a closet. And I, that's funny. I totally started with the linen closet, like you said, cause I mm-hmm. thought like, this will be easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember like getting through, it took a while, you, you know, year, a year, whatever. And then I remember like a year, a couple of years later thinking, where did all this stuff come from? And that's when I was like, it doesn't end. <laughs> like you just have to keep, realize that it doesn't end. Just keep cleaning out because it just stuff accumulates however it happens. Yeah. Um, so I, that's. I- just say what like the woman that I was talking to today about her house that had no boundaries um I I like to say you know she's I said you you, your space is finite your stuff isn't so you have only so much closet space but the stuff keeps coming and it keeps multiplying so you need to make your stuff fit your space Mm -hmm. not your space fit your stuff because otherwise that's how you end up with a crib in your office so You've got to get rid of what the elliptical gets out. You just, you're not using it. It's taking it out and you start cleaning out because your storage space, your, your physical footprint of your house is, is your limit. And a simple example I like to give is I have a shelf in my closet for purses. It's about five or six feet long and it's, I like purses and that holds a lot of purses, but I don't have room for any more. And if I get a new purse, I get rid of an old purse. And I, that's a, an example of my stuff needs to conform to the space that I've allowed for it. Otherwise, it'll creep into my toothpaste drawer. And, you know, that's not going to work. That's really good because I always used to tell my kids everything has a place. It has a so home. If, yeah. And every, if you have something, you know, where does it go? And there, if there's nowhere for it to go, then like you just said, then maybe 
something you have needs to go. And then that if you really want this, or if they got shirts or something, I'm, I'm like, sure, you get three new shirts. Now go to your closet <laughs> and mm-hmm. find three shirts that you don't wear anymore. Um, but I like that a lot because um, it's easy for, like you said, our stuff to take over mm-hmm. the space. And I think, you know, you talked earlier about how does this help our health and you know, you're doing such a great job modeling for your kids. But I, I think that if a child sees calm and order and control in a house, they too feel fortified and reassured going through the day. They, you know, they just, they just don't, they, if they go to a friend's house and it's just chaos, they're going to come home and go, Whew, nice, it's nice to be here. So I think that is something you instill. I agree. And I think that's huge because I just think we all should be able to come home to a house that we feel calm. The world is crazy enough. It's nice to come home and feel calm and at peace and, you know, not surrounded by more overwhelm. But I know it's a process and I know that it's hard, but one step at a time. So I like all the directions that you gave us today. And I do like, I think that Right Fit book is um, definitely one for us to start with. A lot of us. There's some good um, exercises where you fill, you answer some questions and it helps you with questions like, do I stay in my house or do I go? I mean, and, and then maybe you stay and there's, there's um, weighted averages like, well, would it be, I'd be happier living here or happier living in Southern California or Texas or Idaho, or, you know, you put the places you sort of dream about living. And then there are questions you ask and, and you value them in various ways. And it actually gives them a score. So you can go, okay, this one's a 96 and this is a 57. I know what I need to do. But that's good though. Something to think about. Cause that's what I always say. Like just, there's always other ways to look at things. And those questions right there give you something to think about that some people might not even be thinking about when it comes to it. You know, are you where you're supposed to be? Um, And then what's your motivation for the change? That was the other thing you brought up, which I like that too. Like what, you know, what's starting it, what's motivating you to make yeah. the change or clean out or. And, and it does give um, some case studies and, you know, people don't, we talked about this already, but it's like, they, they don't know what they don't know. You don't know the future, but you know, the past. So they sort of stay stuck in a rut because it's the known versus the unknown, but you can make pretty good, reasonable assumptions about how life would be better if, and, I have a one woman who, who did not stick the landing, who, who moved out of her home and didn't end up liking where she ended up, but it wasn't because she shouldn't have moved. It was because she didn't move quite to the right place and she adjusted, she course corrected. So give yourself a hall pass. You may not get it right the first time. A lot of people do, most people do, but if you're making a change, it may not be the, may not be wrong to leave your home, but it, and you may not end up where you want to be, but you're on your way. And it's, yeah. it's a journey. Exactly. Exactly. I like that. Give yourself grace and you can always um, try again. That's right. Yeah. So where where can people find you? Where is it that you, you are mostly? Well, if you don't get a paper that carries my column, and that's a lot of about, oh gosh, 20 or so papers in the country do, um, but you can certainly find me on my blog. And um, or my website, Marnie Jameson, M-A-R-N-I-J-A-M-E-S-O-N.com. And the blog, you can sign up for free. And it has my column two weeks after it runs in the papers, which pay for it. It's a subscriber, you know, the newspaper subscribe to the column. I let them have it first. And when they're done with it, then I post the same column on my blog. So you get it, but just maybe two and a half weeks later. So Mother's Day may be a little, feel a little late, but <laughs> you don't get the same content right. um, for free every Monday in your inbox. So um, you're welcome to find me there. And my books are there. You can order them through Amazon or online or through my website or whatever you want. And are you on any social media or any of that? Oh, I'm pretty bad about that. <laughs> That's okay. I am too. So no worries. I just thought I would put that out there. I do. Um, I do have a home. I do a Facebook at home with Marnie. Um, I do have a Facebook page. I don't visit it all. I don't, you know, I, I, I post it on there once in a while, but I'm not really good at it. And I do have a, a Twitter, which now X, but don't really, not terribly active. 
That's okay. So the best place would be to go to your website and sign up if you don't get a paper and then at least they'd get your articles. Cause I have really enjoyed your articles and I'm lucky enough that my mom still gets a paper, <laughs> but I have enjoyed um, your articles and um, they're all different topics, but I love the home topics cause I am a realtor as well. So I have the whole health background. Yeah. And so the whole home, exactly what you just talked about really, um, merged into that too, because I'm a big believer in, um, you know, if you're not happy where you are, make a change. It's up to us. Yeah. Well, as a so. realtor, you're probably, well, first of all, you're probably dealing with people who need to downsize and you know, the stuff is in their way and their stuff would show better and sell and the house oh, would sell gosh. faster yes. for a lot more money if they only cleared out half of the stuff. And I've given talks about this to realty, realtor groups and, uh, you know, how can we get our, our clients to cooperate? But. Well, it's amazing too, even, you know, when you're looking at houses online, cause I do that a lot too. I love looking at, you know, houses in different areas and thinking about the future and the pictures that come up. I mean, you have to be able to see past them if you really want to sometimes find a good deal, but I'm like shocked sometimes that I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, that someone's trying to sell their house with their cluttered pictures, how much it changes when you, when you clear something out, it really does and make it your own or you know, make it the way you want it. Yeah. So. It's, I'm staging it. I was uh, for six years when I moved from Colorado to Florida, uh, I was a live in home stager. I lived in high end homes and staged them with my furnitures to help them sell. And I would wow. get divorce and I was single and I didn't want to buy a house. And, you know, um, so I was just, I didn't know if I was, my daughter was going to like her high school. I didn't know if I wanted to stay here. So I liked the transition part of it. Like I wasn't committed to a lease or, or a new house, but I moved six times in four years in big houses and staged them to sell. And I really know the part, I was very good at it actually. And I was, you know, the better I was at it, the faster the home sold. Ah, So there I was out on the street again, but, um, but I totally get the power of staging and I've written about it and it's, um, it's, it makes all the difference. So interesting. Yes. I would believe that. What an interesting job though, to go from house to house. That's kind of exciting. <laughs> no, not really, <laughs> but it was, um, it was a means to an end. I did, you know, I, I did live in beautiful houses for a very low price while I was transitioning my personal life and. Um, you know, then I, I met, did meet a wonderful guy. And one of the things he said is, I never want to see you have to do that again. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I, know, I, knew, I knew it was love. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do think it goes back though. Our home is, it's where we spent, you know, it's, it's our place. It's our resting place. It's our the thing we come home to after a long day or whatever. And I, I always say when I'm um, away on vacation, I don't want to be sad to leave. I want to be excited to get back to my home. And that was always like a goal of mine. And every time we go on vacation, I feel like my whole family, even though we might be sad to leave, we are so excited to come back to our home because we love our home. Yep. I feel the same way. Yeah. And it should nurture you and, and be a place you want to come home to every single day and be. Well, I love that. So thank you, Marnie. I feel like for your time, I hope everyone goes to find you at your website because not only are you good at writing about decluttering, um, but all the other topics of, of home and um, decor and finding the right things. You you have a great, and the art, I saw that when I was at my mom's yesterday, you wrote about art on the cruise ship, I think. Mm. And it was, I have that um, to read later because I just thought it was all very interesting. So oh, thank you. So thank you so much for your time, um, spending this time with us. And um, I, I just really appreciate it. I enjoyed our conversation today. Well, same here. And I'm happy to come back anytime. And thank you for your interest. I would love to have that. And I, I probably will be reaching out to you because you have a, plenty of other good topics I can dig into with you. So thanks so much, Marnie. My pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing this time with me today. I am grateful you are here and if you have anyone that you feel could also benefit from this encouragement, please share it with them today. You can also add a quick review on iTunes, which would mean the world to me and help me just to make this better for each and every one of you out there. I will be here each week, so please be sure to subscribe to the podcast or join me at kellyrenato.com to get the latest episode and more tools to help you on your journey to feel your best 
and enjoy every single day exactly where you are. I would love to have you join my journey and let's all add good, healthy vibes anywhere we can every single day. Enjoy your week and embrace the season you're in. And I look forward to next week. Take care. Bye-bye.